Thank you, Stuart. Uh, so this presentation will be a bit more uh, dealing with uh, technical and practical issues of, uh, of this uh, type of activities. Um, so if, if I'm getting too technical, please ask questions. I mean, the, the intent uh, is to give you an overview of what can be done to, to use uh, some parameters uh, in, in practical applications. Uh, so the activity has been supported uh, by a lot of collaborators, both uh, at uh, INRIM and uh, also at uh, PTB in, in the group of uh, Hans. And uh, I will also briefly discuss. Okay, so the, the, the summary uh, is here. I, I would like to tell you about our motivations. Then I will describe what the damping constant uh, alpha is and how it can be used. Uh, in this sense, I will give you just a, a brief overview of the, of the nanospin project, which was recently concluded in the same frame of, uh, of METMAGS. And then I will, get, uh, I will give you some details about the ferromagnetic resonance and damping measurements in different uh, uh, domains and uh, also in different type of, uh, of samples. Uh, and then uh, finally, I will uh, show you some recent results uh, obtained uh, by Hans uh, and his group. So why, why are we interested uh, in, uh, in uh, measuring uh, uh, ferromagnetic resonance uh, characteristics and damping? The point is that uh, um, these conductive magnetic materials, such as permaloy, are used in a lot of uh, applications. And uh, it's, uh, it's very important to have a reliable characterization of materials. Uh, typically, in the literature, you find a lot of results. But uh, how reliable these results are is not uh, uh, immediately uh, apparent. So uh, it's important to know that uh, it is possible to have some traceable and, and repeatable uh, characterization. <clears throat> uh, when, uh, when you go to microwave uh, frequencies, as, as uh, Hans uh, uh, just told us, uh, the bandwidth of, of these devices is, is in the gigahertz range. So nowadays, hard disks and, and memories are supposed to work higher than, at higher frequencies than, than one gigahertz. Uh, in this, uh, in this uh, frequency uh, regime, uh, the, the ferromagnetic resonance dominates uh, the, the, the physical behavior. Uh, ferromagnetic resonance means there is an, uh, a sharp energy absorption peak. And uh, so most of the discussion here we'll, uh, I will present is on how to detect uh, and measure this uh, uh, energy absorption. Uh, there is a very, very well-defined uh, uh, theory on, uh, on the FMR, which is described by, by the Kittel formula. Uh, but uh, I will also show you that uh, there are many effects uh, that um, we need to take into account to, to obtain this uh, uh, very well-defined uh, uh, law. Um, there are also additional effects uh, which are uh, uh, discovered uh, every, every other day. Uh, one of, uh, of the recent ones is uh, spin pumping. The, uh, the, the point uh, is that uh, wh whenever you have uh, uh, a magnetic material, it, it does occur that uh, some spin polarized electrons diffuse into nearby materials. And uh, you can have uh, uh, by this effect, you can have a broadening of the of the fMR absorption due to just to the vicinity of something else um, so the the final goal is to minimize uh, the uncertainties and to uh, get better to improve the the measurement techniques uh, so first of all uh, we we talk about damping so damping means uh, that uh, here again uh, we have uh, uh, two magnetic materials uh, separated by, by a spacer. Uh, as Hans uh, showed us, uh, using uh, spin torque, uh, 
we can induce uh, some uh, uh, effect into a, a nearby magnetic layer. Among the effects, uh, we can have switching, but we can also <coughs> induce some oscillations. And uh, uh, one of the uh, oscillation is a precession. If, if we have uh, uh, an external magnetic field, which here is represented by the black arrow, and, and then we, we try to wiggle the magnetization from this direction, we will have some sort of precession. And uh, this precession can be described <laughs> by uh, uh, this equation, which is, uh, um, is the time evolution of the magnetization in this, in this geometry. And actually, how, f how fast uh, the magnetization will go back to its original position uh, is described by, by this damping parameter. So it's a dissipation of energy because uh, we, we start from an equilibrium position, we go off equilibrium, and then we go back to the equilibrium. So uh, there are, uh, let's say, different sources of, uh, of energy dissipation, and uh, uh, alpha is uh, sort of a summarizing uh, coefficient. Um, in some cases, it can be taken as a, as a, as a sum of different uh, components. Uh, and uh, actually, it is also possible uh, refining the analysis to obtain the, the, the different, to separate different effects and to see different uh, uh, contributions. Uh, let's say that if, if one needs to, to quantify the performance uh, of spintronic devices, uh, maybe uh, one needs additional uh, detail. Uh, again, to, just to give you an idea, uh, I'm not sure how many people have seen uh, how the permeability, the real and the imaginary part of, uh, of the permeability of a material uh, uh, are, but uh, in what happens uh, in, uh, in the vicinity of the FMR is that uh, the imaginary part, which corresponds to dissipation, shows a peak in red here, and the real part uh, shows uh, this uh, transient. Uh, uh, so whenever we, we observe a peak in correspondence of an inflection point, uh, that is where the FMR is. And uh, uh, alpha actually corresponds uh, to the, the line width of the, of the red peak. Uh, these measurements uh, are typically, uh, due to the fact that they are in the microwave regime, uh, we need to use fairly expensive equipment. But this is not mandatory. I, I will show you, let's say, older techniques which do not imply uh, the use of, uh, of very sophisticated uh, uh, analyzers, uh, but uh, only need uh, a, a microwave-capable uh, diode, which is a fairly cheap piece of, of, of equipment. Um, in our recent experiments, uh, we, we used uh, uh, some time domain uh, uh, oscilloscopes, uh, which either in, uh, in uh, sampling mode or in real time, uh, can go below 50 picoseconds, so th these are fairly expensive pieces of, of hardware. And also in the time domain, which means using vector ne network analyzers, we go uh, up and even above 30 gigahertz. So we are talking about uh, objects uh, which cost in the range between 20 to 50 to 150,000 euros, depending on the bandwidth. Uh, as far as materials, uh, um, typically we, we study permalloy. Uh, there are other materials. Permalloy is um, uh, interesting, as Hans uh, mentioned, uh, due to the fact that it is insensitive to uh, mechanical stress, uh, among, among other things. It has fairly high uh, saturation magnetization. Nickel and iron are fairly abundant, and they are not uh, expensive to buy. Uh, the only problem is that uh, if they are not in the right uh, uh, stoichiometry, uh, we can see a lot of additional effects. And also, it's fairly sensitive to, to uh, preparation. Um, so if one uh, takes a film of permalloy, the, uh, the damping parameter 
is in the order of 10 to minus 2. Uh, it can be decreased a little bit uh, depending on, uh, on how you, you measure it. Let's say depending if you are, study, uh, if you are studying only intrinsic uh, uh, damping or if you are taking into account also extrinsic, let's say, additional uh, terms uh, related to damping. Uh, this number, uh, whatever you do, tends to go up, never to go down. <laughs> because if you change the composition a little bit, it goes up. If the sample is dirty, it goes up. Uh, whatever, if you bend it, uh, if you bend the sample, uh, what, whatever you do, it, it goes up. Uh, another good feature of permaloy is the fact that uh, it can be simulated uh, uh, fairly well by uh, a lot of... Uh, software packages and uh, this uh, study is uh, uh, on, still ongoing so there are lots of uh, uh, ways to, to improve. Uh, so th there are two main uh, configurations uh, for, for this type of measurements. Uh, it depends on let's say that the, the sample is a thin film so you can either choose to apply the field in the in the, film plane, in the field in the film plane or out of plane. And we have two different uh, Kittel formulas for, uh, uh, for the different uh, geometries. Uh, let's say the main difference is that if the field is in plane, there is a quadratic dependence on applied field. And if the field is out of plane, there is a linear dependence. So uh, whenever you see a, an overview of, of uh, the the FMR peak behavior, uh, either one or the other. Um, the, the fact that, that we are talking about uh, uh, micro, microwave frequencies uh, comes uh, uh, to, to this uh, little detail. There is a constant which appears, and this constant uh, is 176 gigahertz per Tesla. So uh, it's, it's a fairly big number. <laughs> So you can, you can uh, immediately see here uh, what are the, the relevant frequencies. And uh, the only, let's say, mitigating effect is, is uh, given by this 4pi, uh, which, which appears. So uh, you need to divide that by uh, 12, more or less. And, and you, you know the ballpark of, of this uh, whole business. Um, so we recently finished uh, a project uh, where uh, one work package was uh, on time and frequency dynamics, uh, which was uh, devoted to studying uh, these effects. Uh, I, I had uh, in, the, in the previous slide uh, the, the main partners and, uh, and, uh, and the contacts for each uh, institution. Here I also have a list of additional collaborators, uh, quite a few. Uh, the, among the, the main results of the time and frequency domain dynamics work package was uh, uh, we developed uh, some reference samples uh, which can be used to, to measure uh, to repeatedly uh, the FMR frequency and damping. And also some work was done on spin torque precession in, in nano devices. Um, so, uh, typical uh, uh, setup for, uh, for FMR measurement includes a coplanar waveguide. Uh, this type of waveguide is uh, as a center conductor here. Uh, the the, the waveguide is the part in white. Uh, the, the part in black is uh, an integrated sample in this uh, sketch. Uh, the other two uh, Parts of the guide are just the ground planes. There are some geometrical uh, relationships to be observed to, to have uh, uh, a 50 ohm impedance matching because the, all the equipment that goes to high frequency uh, needs to be matched to 50 ohm in order to transfer as much power as possible through the, the waveguide. Um, uh, well, for the frequency domain, one uses uh, uh, a VNA, a vector network analyzer. Uh, these objects are, are able to, to, let's say, they have two ports. And uh, one typically measures uh, the, the signal which is transmitted through the, the, the device under test. 
in this case, uh, the, the device under test is the waveguide with or without uh, the, the material. And, uh, uh, and then one gets uh, um, the, the signal amplitude and also the phase. So a, a vector network analyzer is able to measure amplitudes and, and phases of the transmitted and reflected signal. Um, so the VNA uh, generates uh, uh, an AC magnetic field in the microwave regime in the, in the waveguide. This, uh, uh, this field uh, uh, excites some precession of the magnetization inside the, the material when the material is there. And then uh, uh, we have some energy absorption which will be detected by the, the network analyzer. Uh, this uh, energy absorption is typically a Lorentzian uh, peak which can be fitted and uh, uh, this fitting determines uh, the, the damping. Uh, the same type of measurements can be also conducted not in the frequency domain which is the, the typical uh, use of, of the VNA but also in the time domain. And, uh, PTB has a, a, a long time expertise in, in this area. Uh, so again, we have the coplanar waveguide. Uh, this time, instead of uh, sending uh, uh, a signal which includes uh, uh, all, all, the, all the frequencies, uh, here we, we send in a peak, which has a lot of uh, harmonic content inside. It's a, it's a very sharp uh, rise time uh, uh, peak of the order of, a, of a 100 picosecond. Uh, no, actually the rise time can be as low as 10 picosecond. Uh, and then uh, what, uh, what uh, they do is the following. Uh, once uh, you apply uh, an, uh, an external magnetic field uh, uh, along uh, the, the sample, along the coplanar waveguide, uh, to make the measurement, and then to have a reference, uh, you apply uh, the external mag magnetic field uh, transversally to the waveguide. This is because uh, when uh, the electromagnetic wave propagates uh, along the, the waveguide, it generates uh, an AC magnetic field which is uh, transverse. So when the external magnetic field is also transverse, the, um, the precession will be nothing because uh, the, the, the signal and the, the, let's say the, the state of the sample will be uh, along uh, the, the, um, the excitation direction. Uh, whereas in the case of the measurement, uh, the, the, the AC magnetic field will be at uh, 90 degrees with uh, uh, external magnetization. So once uh, one subtracts uh, one, one output from the other, uh, a sinusoidally uh, damped uh, um, signal can be extracted, you see here in red, and by FFT analysis of this uh, uh, signal, one can extract the frequency and the, and the line width uh, of, the, of the damping. Uh, usually the, the analysis is, is conducted at different amplitudes of the uh, uh, external field. Oops. Yes, as shown up here in the in the graph. Uh, so this is a typical uh, result of the analysis. This is the pulse applied, and these are the outputs at, uh, and and these are the uh, FFT analysis performed. You can see that the peak changes uh, shape depending on the on the um, on the external field and also changes uh, especially the position in frequency because the higher the applied field the external applied field the higher the uh, relevant frequency uh, among the uh, important uh, nanospin results was that uh, we were able to to compare different uh, frequency domain setups uh, uh, positively we were also uh, able to, to obtain a, a positive comparison be, between uh, frequency and time domain uh, results, both for the frequency evolution and uh, the, the line width. 
Uh, we also found out that uh, um, thin film samples mu must be handled properly. One big issue is uh, humidity. So if you, if you leave uh, uh, a thin film sample in, in, in the air without proper care, uh, humidity will uh, somehow degrade the, 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 the surface uh, characteristics very rapidly. And uh, this will uh, uh, increase the damping uh, very much. Uh, and then the, the final result was uh, to also to compare time and frequency domain setups uh, uh, using uh, integrated samples. And uh, we saw that uh, there is uh, some effect uh, connected to the, the geometry and that this is still under uh, some investigation. Um, just to give you uh, some additional detail on, on, the, on the measurement techniques, uh, the, let's say that the simplest one is uh, using a, a, short, uh, a short connector. So only, uh, one only uses one port of the vector network analyzer. And here I have a, a view graph on, uh, on a um, coaxial uh, uh, connector. Uh, the point here is that the sample needs to be a toroidal one, but uh, the, this geometry is very good because it can be computed analytically and it leads to particularly simple uh, uh, equations uh, for uh, deriving uh, the, the, the permeability, the real and imaginary part of the permeability. Uh, this type of geometry can also be used for thin films uh, as long as one has a, a toroidal uh, substrate. So one needs to, to deposit on a toroidal substrate. Uh, the results, uh, uh, these measurements were, were made uh, by uh, some colleagues in Japan. You can see that uh, this, uh, uh, this is the evolution of, of the uh, real and imaginary part of the fMR peaks. Uh, uh, for different fields, and you can see that this uh, uh, set of uh, measurements evolves uh, uh, toward higher and higher frequency uh, of the fMR as uh, the field increases up to 30 millitesla. Um, another possible geometry is to use a macroscopic coplanar waveguide, which can be uh, obtained uh, uh, commercially. These are just uh, some connectors which uh, allow to, to, to have uh, a coaxial cable uh, connected to, to a flat uh, surface. The sample can be positioned uh, just on top of the waveguide. And uh, you can see here the waveguide is, uh, is then inserted in an electromagnet. And uh, the electromagnet uh, uh, is such that uh, the field can be applied either along uh, the, the coplanar waveguide or transversally or out of plane because uh, you just take it out of the, of the electromagnet. This allows a, a very large flexibility. Typical results again are shown here. Uh, if you apply a low magnetic field, uh, you have this peak. And uh, this other peak, which is inverted, is, is the reference uh, uh, measurement, which uh, is uh, subtracted. Uh, when we increase the magnetic field, the, the peak shifts, whereas the uh, reference uh, measurement remains at the same position. Uh, as, uh, as I told you, the it is possible there is the, the Kittel formula, which describes uh, the, the field evolution of, of the frequency uh, of the fMR peak. And uh, I, I told you that in plane uh, there is a quadratic dependence, which can be seen here. Uh, so it's, uh, this is a superposition of a lot of experimental results uh, with uh, uh, the Kittel formula fitting. And you can see that the Kittel formula in, in red uh, very well describes uh, this uh, phenomena. Uh, over here, uh, you see a bit larger scattering, uh, but uh, an overall agreement between uh, uh, 
three different sets of, of alpha damping measurements made uh, with the time domain and frequency domain uh, setups. So th this is part of the positive results of the, of the nanospin project. Uh, uh, as, I, as I announced before, there is a, an additional way to, to perform the measurements. All you do is uh, you send uh, a microwave signal through the, through the uh, waveguide and into the sample. And all you do uh, is you keep the, the frequency fixed. And instead of changing the frequency, you change the applied field. Once you hit the condition of, of FMR uh, by changing the field, in this case, you will observe uh, uh, an absorption. So now here we, we are keeping the frequency uh, fixed, 3 gigahertz, 3.25, 375, 4 gigahertz, and we sweep, we increase the applied field. Uh, once the resonant uh, conditions are met, uh, you, will see, you see here that we have, uh, again, a Lorentzian uh, peak. Uh, this Lorentzian peak can be analyzed uh, and uh, we obtain, again, the FMR frequency and the damping. Uh, the good part is that, in this case, we only need uh, to have uh, um, a microwave generator and a diode at the end of the circuit. So we, we're just measuring the transmitted power. And uh, this technique is very powerful because here the damping uh, will be measured uh, as a, as, a, as a fitting of, uh, of a lot of different points. Uh, and so this technique, uh, although uh, more time consuming, uh, is, um, is, is very powerful because allows one to also to determine the uh, intrinsic and extrinsic components of damping. Um, there are several applications uh, of, of this uh, technique. One uh, is uh, what uh, uh, Hans uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, described. So it is possible to, to characterize uh, uh, nano-sized uh, samples. So we, in this case, uh, the circuit is slightly different. We may need uh, a bias T, is, which is an object uh, which allows to separate uh, uh, DC from, from AC signals, uh, not to, let's say, not to uh, burn uh, uh, our VNA or our oscilloscope. And uh, this DC signal uh, can be used to, to obtain uh, this uh, spin polarization and spin interaction um, effects uh, like uh, spin torque in a, in a, in a nano device. Uh, there are different experiments which can be performed either in the time domain or uh, the frequency domain. The, the, there are no major uh, differences. Uh, um, let's say that the, the main point is that the, the frequency domain also allows uh, to, to have a broadband uh, characterization. Uh, I, I will just briefly mention one application. Uh, Hans and his group recently worked on, uh, on defining what is, what is the, uh, the tunnel barrier thickner, thickness which is optimal for a, for a memory application. Uh, let's say here, the, the, the point here is the following. Uh, if we use a spin transfer torque, we can build uh, some memory elements using a magnetic tunnel junction. This magnetic tunnel junction is composed uh, of, of two uh, film uh, layers, which need to be uh, coupled through, through these uh, spin polarized uh, currents. Uh, the point is that uh, whenever one uh, wants to develop uh, uh, a very, very small memory element of, uh, let's say, below 100 nanometer. Uh, there are several features which uh, must appear. One is that the um, resistance times area product uh, has to be lower than uh, 5 ohm per micron uh, square. 
Uh, this is because the, there needs to be some impedance uh, matching with, with the external world. Uh, the signal, the, the resistance uh, uh, between the two states when, when the magnetizations of the layers are parallel or, or uh, parallel, they, they must, uh, this signal must change a lot. So uh, it can be as high as, as uh, 1,000 but uh, one has to choose depending on, on uh, the geometry of the device. And uh, there must be uh, a, the lowest possible current uh, flowing through in order to switch. All this uh, uh, leads to, to, to a set of uh, conditions. Uh, and again, the, there is an additional uh, a very critical issue. Uh, if one uh, needs to do these tests on pattern, uh, so if, if I need to build a, a 100 nanometer uh, object to make the measurements, it, it will be uh, more costly to develop <laughs> the object than, than to do the, the measurements. Uh, so it's important to develop some, some general technique which does not need patterning. And uh, the main result here was that the technique uh, using all, all what I've shown you is also able to characterize uh, um, a wafer or, or uh, let's say uh, a small area of a wafer but, but not a, a, a nano size uh, object in order to determine what, you, what is the, the the best tunnel barrier thickness for this specific application. Uh, just to give you an example of, of the control of, uh, of, uh, of the processing, so they determined that the, the optimal uh, barrier thickness is between 0.76 and 0.25 nanometers. What is really mind-boggling is the fact that somebody is able to produce objects <laughs> controlling the thickness between 0.6 and 0.9 nanometers over a large area. <laughs> this, is, this is really the, <laughs> the, the result. And uh, so the, the key issue here is uh, there is a lot of money being spent on the te technology to produce these objects, but there is not enough thought being given to, to how to characterize these things on, on such wide areas. Uh, when, you, when you produce nanopattern things, the, the first uh, uh, most evident uh, effect to the experimentalist is that the sample dies as soon as you touch it. Because uh, even a, a small static current uh, through such a small object uh, will, will produce uh, the brightest uh, LED you have ever seen, but for a very brief moment. <laughs> okay, I think I should conclude here because uh, it's getting late. <laughs> Thank you very much.